was my second, first composition teacher, Baranda Reyes. He actually, there are so many musicians around the world that became professional musicians and studied with him. He was there, I spent the first year I started with him, I learned piano and composition, he was both. And I spent a whole year on the first movement of a Beethoven sonata. He just wouldn't let me move on until that was perfect. Um, and then I would also, you know, when I wouldn't practice, sometimes he was, he would get very upset and just grab my music and throw it across the room and send me home. To me, the lesson, the piano lesson or composition, which at first it was all in, in one, it was just the place for me to go and make people hear me. You know, I was, I always thought I was better than everybody else, even if I wasn't. Uh, but I went there just to show off everybody that, and to have people, what I loved is nobody could talk while I was playing. And as a, as a little kid, that was for me heaven. You know, to have people just be quiet and me take over, right? I remember some of the first times that I heard certain pieces. I remember what I felt. It was something so... Uh, you can't tell, you can't express what it is. It's just you hear something and then you would... I would play it over and over and over obsessively, you know, for three days trying to figure out what it is that makes it so fascinating. Well, it's a good, an important tool for a composer to be uh, obsessive, compulsive. Uh, no, it's part of it because when you write music, you have to have the music take over. It really does. It takes over in your head and it repeats like a broken record. So if you manage to get that to um, that level of involvement in what you're doing, then you can get more and more and more into a piece that you're writing. My first memories were things that made noise. I, um, like my play, I, I remember I would arrange, when I was a kid in the patio, I would get like uh, from the kitchen pots and things and I would put them all there. Um, I had a little glockenspiel, which to me was just magic. Um, and I would arrange them like in an orchestra position. I mean, they were in parts, in my mind they were drums. And, and I would sort of conduct them, but I, I was conducting them and they were making music and I was singing what they were making. So there was always that need to hear or make music and I didn't know what that was, I didn't know. The first time I saw the keys of a piano, it was um, now that I'm, as an adult, I would sort of, um, it's not that far from, you know, sexual liking or, or something so much. It was just like those black and white keys. It was really um, fascinating. It was fascinating. So I was terrible at violin. I studied two years, never passed the first year exam. And one day I sort of hit the violin against the wall. That's when my dad said, I still have the violin. It's an expensive violin from 1783. And my dad said, that's it. So they let me do piano and just write music. And I remember in elementary school, uh, I went to the same school all the, the years and from kindergarten to sixth grade. And there was a theater. It was always close and dark and humid. And, there was a piano there. So we had a um, half hour break and most of the break, my favorite thing to do was to sneak into the theater and just play in absolute darkness on that piano. One day they discovered me and they kind of didn't let me in go. They locked it and then I started crying and so they, they actually opened it and it was like a secret. It, Everybody at school knew I was doing that and it was bad, but they sort of let me. Some of the times when I got thrown the book across the room, I would uh, play some piece by Chopin, and I always thought I could improve on it, which is silly, only kids think that way, right? But I would play something by Chopin and I thought, this is not right, so I would actually change it.
Composing is more to me like decomposing because I first hear, if I write for orchestra, I do hear the entire thing first. I hear the entire sound, I hear the whole orchestra. And then what you have to do is actually just take those layers away so that you can notate them, so that you can write them. But a lot of people think it's the opposite. You, you come up with a lute part and then you add a clarinet part and then one, at the end you end up with an orchestra sound. And that would be very difficult because you cannot, it's like building the Empire State out of piling up a window and two steps of the stairs and a refrigerator. So first you have to see the whole thing and then you start extracting the parts to write them. You have to isolate a lot according to how long the piece that you're writing is or how difficult you isolate for different periods of time. For a, to write an opera, you really need to live in the world of that opera for a year or so and that's, that's your world, that's a reality. You gather ideas, they are all in your head and then one day they take over. And that day you don't go out anymore, you don't answer the phone, you don't shower, you don't eat, you start working and in the morning you can't wait to get up. So you enter that zone where really nothing matters but what you're working because you're living in that world, you're part of the world of the music. And it, I don't know, when, when you reach a crisis in the middle where you feel you're never going to finish this piece and you write and rewrite, I throw away a lot of what I rewrite most of the time. So there are some exception pieces that pretty much write themselves. You just write and write and they're done. But sometimes you revise and, um, and then, you know, the time comes, you get some idea and then the whole thing is done and you come out into the world back and you realize half of your friends are offended because you didn't return their calls and um, I don't know, you, you haven't eaten for, for three days or things like that. And so you slowly go, go back to normalcy until you write your next piece. And it's good and bad. It's very good because um, you get things done and you enjoy it when you are in there. It's very bad because it's like, it's like being on a virtual world, really. It's not real, it's not the world. It's, you're missing lots of things from the real world. You know, I lived in Uruguay through a horrible military repressive government and the whole collapse of a country, an economy and everything. Um, so it was, I needed it very much to isolate and go to that space, just out of survival, right? Uh, and, but I think as time goes by, you need it less. I don't know if it's because you're happier with the outside world, or if as you get older, you learn to live in the world you are in more. Your friends don't live forever. Your family, you, you lose somebody in your family that you love, like I lost my younger brother, and you realize how many hours you were alone in your own world and all these people were there and their lives continued without you and you weren't a part of this and you weren't a part of that and you missed this and that. And I think those probably are the things that make you think twice, you know, when you get a, a new uh, commission. Now that's what I do. I, I do it gladly is what I do. I know the good and the bad of it and that's why some people say, oh, you're a musician, that's so great, and you even get paid for it. Um, I said, well, yes, I'm, I do what I, I love what I do. It's, it's, you know, it gives me so much pleasure, and, and, um, but it's a job. I, I, I wrote Concerto and Tango, it's a cello concerto. Uh, I wrote over Christmas, and I was from Christmas to New Year's, to first week of January and some days I worked 17 hours non-stop because I timed it and now I do that I sort of time it when I look the clock and I see them then I realize this is you need to stop now 
when it comes to your mood, everything, every time I hear a um, <clears throat> woman who gave birth talk about what happens after, it's very similar. There is sort of a depression period. At first, you're so excited. You know, even now that I've, I've written 115 works, so you shouldn't be that excited. It's just one more. But you are. You wake up in the morning with that in your head, and you dream of the whole night. But when the score is finished, sometimes I bring it to my night table, and at night I can't stop looking at it. And in the morning, you wake up and you just look at it like, wow, you're fascinated, which is. You know, many women say that's what happens when you have a baby. You're fascinated. You can't think of anything. But then you start kind of having this depression because there is an empty period that's not structured anymore. Um, and the longer, the, the bigger the piece, the more that it requires that you are in this zone, the longer that recuperation period is. What makes me feel that I'm doing what I'm supposed, what I'm meant to be doing, is music. I, I tried, you know, it's a tough life being a musician. I, you could do almost anything else and make more money with it. And I remember a few times I tried not, I rebel against music. I, I, felt, I felt it more like a curse because I never got to decide what to do. I remember a few times I tried to do other things. Um, for example, because of my musical ears, I'm very good at um, direct interpreting. And I realized I could make money with that because there is few people who can do that. Right? And <clears throat> somehow I started doing this and um, I, I started getting a lot of work and I started getting more and more depressed. And I felt like I was, my life had no meaning. And that's what I realized having tried in life many things, that everything else I'm very interested in and I can do it. But I'm, after I do it for a few months, I start having this feeling that I'm wasting my time. That it's not, I'm supposed to be doing that other thing. And I think that's probably for some reason what I, I was put in this world to do and I have to keep doing it. Um, it never goes on automatic. I mean, it's forever. Uh, or if you're playing too much piano, which I, I enjoy performing, I really do. But when I'm practicing, I'm feeling guilty because I'm not writing music. And writing music is what I think I do best. Um, so if I'm writing too much music and I haven't practiced for six months, like now I'm in that period, you feel guilty because you see your muscles you know, they're going away, your technique is going away. Like many musicians, I think I was very selfish for my first 30 years, nothing mattered about my music. And I sacrificed good times, relationships, friends, just one day I had to pack and move to Vienna and I didn't look back, I just went. That was what my career needed and I did. And I, I think, then you realize there is more than just music. There is more than your career or uh, there is people. There is also the same way you can leave one more piece that you write when you die, but you can also leave good friends and people who loved you and people who have good memories of you. And that's, I think that's also meaningful and, and um, it gives in a way, it gives the meaning to life that your existence is not confined to your body and your mind when you're writing music. It just goes into the minds of other people. I can go to a room, be there for a whole evening, come out of the room, the door closes, somebody asks me, what color were the walls? I have no idea. But if you ask me, uh, what did it sound like? What did it feel like? That I can tell you 10 years from now. Sometimes I even do the wrong wording. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm eating something that I like and I say, this sounds really good. And I just catch myself, sounds. And it's, everything is really transformed to sound. And I think it's just what it is. That was my best sense. And 
I perceive the world through my ears. But there is also the emotional color of things. There is the, the darkness of a double base. And it's emotional. It's, it's, not a, it's, it's not just the surface of a color on a painting. It's a, the color of your feelings, the color of your emotions. Your, it's, it's painted in your brain, inside of your head, your thoughts. And, and that's um, why when you write music, you do write in color, because it's not only you hear the sound of a double bass, you know, playing a low note with a, with a bassoon playing the low register note, and that is so dark from the outside. The, the whole sound, the orchestra, all these massive things, if you're outside of it, it's hard. But if you're inside of it, actually it's in your brains, but you feel you're inside of it. It's all there. You're a part of it. Then it's really easy because you're just it's the world you're hearing, and um, you can see it all. You write this music, and they're like your children in a way, each one. But then they go away, so my music goes, I'm not a part of it. You write it, other people play it, and, and that's it. Um, and that's also part of the isolation of a composer, which I don't really like. And if you perform, you have a chance to go and play, but you can't be. Um, you know, everywhere. Actually, today, um, the, this piece is, uh, is called Boliviana for guitar and string quartet, and it's playing at uh, this has the Swiss premiere at the uh, Napoleon's Museum. That's a Bodensee in, in Switzerland. Uh, it's a beautiful castle. That's where Napoleon used to live there. Um, and I thought to hear a piece, you know, with Bolivian influence in this totally different world, you know? And so I would, I would have loved to be there. And then tomorrow and Sunday, it's the Canadian first performance of this last cello concerto that I wrote, Concerto and Tango. And, and that's a big thing. It's, it's part of the Pan American Games opening. And for what I, I've read is the biggest um, event, games event, they're expecting the big, the largest amount of um, audience for the, so, and then again, it's, it would be so nice if I could be there, right? Uh, and then tomorrow is also the premiere of my sextet for winds and piano in France, in uh, Rosheim. Um, so that's, in a way, you, all these questions you asked me about being a composer, Part of it is the, the fact that you are not a, totally a part of the real world of things is the fact that you write music and then it goes away and then you're no longer a part of it. You are, you are here and everything happens somewhere else. Um, and uh, somehow you have to keep those two things together, you know, and keep writing music. Yes, music gives me meaning, and uh, I'm, I see myself as the composer, but it's no longer my total um, who I am. And I think that's kind of healthy. Um, in a way, I'm happy my music is played there, and you know, um, for those people, somehow I'm there because what I felt when I was writing that music, it comes alive now when they play it, so somehow I'm there. Um, but somehow I'm just here talking to you and I'm not a part of that. So I'm cut off from what my music sort of, um, it's supposed to take me. I, I think I still have my best words. They're still to be written. And it's, I want, I need to let them out. I need to, they are in there. And I think I, I don't have forever. So I, that's important that I need to write those works before I die. Why? I don't know why, and I don't really care why, but it's just, that's, that's an important thing for me. And then probably enjoy life, you know, with people I love, and, and that's also important, that's you know, as much as writing music. Uh.